Tom, welcome to the Christians in Sport podcast. You know, we like to start by saying, uh, what does it mean for you to have your sport and faith connect to play or to coach or to look after people connected? What does that say to you when I ask it? Great first question. Uh, first of all, great to be with you. Um, lovely to be sharing this conversation. Um, that's a really powerful question, actually, because when I think about um, my experiences in sport as a player, as a coach, as a performance psychologist, oftentimes the question I'd ask is, what, what defines performance in sport? And when you, we go beyond the technical, tactical, physical, we get into the realms of mental and emotional. Mm. So self-confidence, um, self-belief, uh, faith. Uh, and then we ask as a performance psychologist, I ask the question, is it possible to work on those things mentally and emotionally to be at my best when it matters? And of course the answer is yes. But if we go even further, if we go beyond the mental and emotional, we inevitably get to the spiritual. And so many times in my life as a, as a player, as a coach, I have had experiences where some, something transformational has taken place and it really wasn't anything to do with me. Mm. <laughs> I was in many ways just a channel for that thing to take place. And I'm speaking about influencing positively the lives mm. of sometimes young children, sometimes senior athletes, sometimes experienced directors, CEOs, global heads of department, something else moving the pieces around. Um, I mean, fascinating start, isn't it, to the conversation because you're, you're a reputed practitioner and you, we'll pick on some of the places you've worked. We heard it from Johnny Reed at the beginning, what your CV is. And, and you've certainly been around the blocks now in professional sport. I am fascinated by the move, the, the, the mental, the emotional, to, to the spiritual. I mean, is that language that you would, is it a concept that you would use in everyday working life when you're working with a range of athletes? You know what's fascinating about this, Dan, though, is that it's it's not just in pro my professional experiences, but mm. also if we look at the academic literature surrounding things like peak state, um, self actualization, uh, how, how we go beyond our just the egoic state into something more than, mm. which allows this potential to unleash itself, and oftentimes it's referenced in the data, this transformational, this going beyond self, not explicitly as um, uh, as a faith based from Christianity, yeah. but certainly referenced in the literature, which leads towards um, faith in God. So um, that, that makes that makes a lot of sense. You can conceptualize it as faith in God, as as Christian faith in in my case or our case for Christians in sport. But the fact that the literature surrounding your discipline. Mm really highlights or at least points to the transformational away from I. Fascinating to me that you, I, I'll pick up then, if you don't mind there, on some of the research you've been involved in, mm. uh, significant research in this regard, because when you started trying to get some depth to your own professional training, you did find that the thesis that you were working on shifted in Concepts towards transformational. Can you can you fill that in for us? Yes. Then? Yeah. Well, it, it kind of coincided with my professional ex my professional um, role at the time. I moved from Brentford um, as performance coach with a senior team to a role with Aston Villa um, as head of performance psychology and culture with the senior team. Huge, great, big global. So give us that title again. Now we've heard it earlier, but yeah. I mean, adding culture to it is some piece. Say the title once more. Yeah. So it was a wonderful new role. Um, created by the, the senior sporting director, yes. head of performance psychology. Which is we well understood in the game. And culture. And culture. Did, yeah. you, did you discuss that together? Did he initiate it? Um, that's, a, that's a big jump yeah. to whole club culture in the Premier League. It certainly is. He and wanted it. 
Certainly did. And I think um, it was, a, I say that was my role. Of course, we know that culture is never really one, just mm. one person's role. Mm. But I think it was the club and the senior board of directors signposting the importance of culture. And that we, if we truly believed in the importance of culture, then we needed to signpost it. Then we needed everyone to buy in and we needed to comprehend what it actually meant, mm. not as some kind of consequence of random chance, but, but a conscious creative process of, of high performance culture that we were all involved with. Mm. Collaboration, I guess you could say, at its best. So Villa were way ahead of their time, I think, in, in terms of signposting the role and combining the two, uh, head of performance psychology, which is a pretty big role in itself. Yes, it is. To tag culture onto the end is, I think, was testament to the fact that they believed that culture was defining in the end for all of us because we're all creating the culture that we live yeah. in. Here we are. So what is it? How do we do that? And how do we improve that process? And then, so, but I was desperately inexperienced at that time because I was um, a lot younger than I am now and uh, had just moved from Brentford, completely different club, smaller club, uh, nowhere near the size of employees as an organization and took a lot of understanding to really get inside the global nature of Aston Villa. It's a titanic of a football club. Mm -hmm. So I realized I needed to upskill myself and, um, but I started the professional doctorate based on asking the question, what is it that defines a culture of excellence in high performance sport? Huge, great big global question, subsequently narrowed down over the years, shifting towards this idea of what is it that helps human beings flourish in competitive sporting environments? You know, athletes, coaches, heads of departments, sporting directors, owners themselves, how do we unleash our inner potential for the benefit of everyone, mm. not just ourselves? And so there, is this, there was a shift between, okay, high performance culture, but deeper than that, let's go beyond that. Let's go beyond unearthing a human being's potential. What is it that's required? Now, listen, before we go any further, let's ground this now. Now, I want a day in the life of, now, all the best, right? <laughs> I want a day in the life of, uh, where should we start? Pick one of the sports and then give, give us that one, a day, but give us a feel of some of the other sports and sports people you work with. A day in the life of. Yeah, okay. Or, well, where should we go? Well, let's go with British for me. So AM meeting, board of directors. Um, thinking about the landscape before Paris 2024, how we best help uh, our emerging athletes come through over the next two years and also solidify the high performance of our current athletes and secure their success. So really just about the journeys of the athletes and how we maximize their, their long-term um, performances. Then probably off to one-to-ones uh, -one with a number of different athletes, and that could be any, any one of the high performance centers, um, at Sterling, at Bath or Loughborough. And this is more of a one-to-one -one interpersonal um, session followed by a little bit of lunch probably somewhere in there and a flat white <laughs> um, uh, off to working with the coaches uh, being in and around the sessions at the centers so observing training in action um, getting to uh, work with the coaches closely and understand where they're at with the programs and each periodized cycle and training plan uh, probably culminating in a in an end of day reflective team performance debrief, connecting all of the practitioners interdisciplinary uh, across the, the country and in many cases the world to make sure that we're all aligned. Um, all right, that's British swimming, but what else could you have been doing on that day? Yeah, could have been down to Bristol with the Bristol Bears rugby team in the premiership, in the Gallagher premiership, working with a fantastic head coach down there by the name of Pat Lamb. Um, again, revolutionary leader. He integrates with the players, with the coaches, uh, with the staff, organization-wide. Um, understands the role really well. But then it could be off to work with a number of different footballers, professional players in the Premier League Championship and down. Up to Sheffield Wednesday uh, to work with the first team there or across down into London to work with uh, GB Basketball. There's just a tremendous variety in the program and that's really what I love that's what I love and it's, I think it's that variety 
which improves the role in many ways in different contexts, you know? I've got to ask how you manage to rest because whenever I do see you, seriously, you're, you're, you, you've got time. You've got time on the ball pretty much always. Uh, and sometimes I'll see you in Zoom calls from your home, with the children around and the dog, wife, obviously. But I, I will, and I'll see you, and you, you do have time on the ball. How do, give us a feel of that then, because with a lot of professional people listening to this, how do you find that? How do you do that? It's a constant working progress. Um, I'm not sure if the proverbial balance exists. Um, I'm really not. Uh, but I do know that, you know, my, would be Hannah, my wife, is just simply fantastic. Um, she is very good at keeping the children in perspective as a priority. And it does take that. Um, I think it takes a conscious prioritization. It would be easy for me to be seven days a week, 6 a.m. till until bed uh, on purely work focused. Let me let me circle back then to your own story. Uh, getting to Villa young in your career <laughs> yeah. with that role and responsibility for the sporting director um, means that you'd made some ground, Brentford to Villa, before that, starting at Bournemouth. Take us back to the earliest days of your own private, personal and professional development, your, your own faith journey mixed with that early start then mm. as a performance psychologist. Mm. Wow. So I'll go all the way back to um, playing schoolboy football uh, in Cambridge uh, and, um, you know, believing in really um, wanting to be a professional footballer and um, got close, played for some uh, great clubs, was part of some wonderful youth development programs and went on trial lots of different places, but ultimately didn't make it. And so therefore that time was probably the first time where I had to sort of question my you know, who am I then? Where am I going then? If this isn't going to be me, this isn't going to be my dream for my life. What else is there? What, who, what is beyond this then? Um, so loved coaching uh, and, and eventually studied psychology um, and PE at A-level at Long Road. Fast forward into uh, Bournemouth, undergraduate, first ever course of its kind, Bachelor of Science, combining sports psychology and coaching sciences. Brilliant, loved it. Um, still wanted to be a coach because I loved playing still, but I was never going to be a professional. Um, and then uh, very blessed to meet some fantastic um, mentors whilst I was studying my undergraduate, outside of the university actually, and came into contact with a guy called Joe Roach, AFC Bournemouth, who was head of youth then, and Eddie Howe, who had just finished his uh, playing days and become Centre of Excellence Manager. Fantastic in the nucleus of of coaching, uh, getting to go on a Thursday night under the Astro turf lights on the, with Eddie taking some sessions and interrupting my session sometimes. <laughs> Had a great technical practice planned and 20 minutes in, he's taking over. <laughs> no, son, no, leave it there. <laughs> uh, so uh, really, really great experience. Hey, was he a great guy? I mean, Fantastic. everybody speaks so well of Eddie Howe oh, wow. from the beginning. Great guy. Yeah, yeah, it's yeah. Up, really, really was. Yeah. And so blessed to be in and around, packed full of enthusiasm. You know, for both of us, I guess we both shared that that we were just starting out and, you know, um, everything was possible. Was mm. Passion and enthusiasm that he had. And his ability to transfer his knowledge from playing to coaching, to different ages, even then, it just finished, was mm. was really incredible. So, but But at the time, to be honest with you, Bournemouth were in League Two. I was still working part-time as a lifeguard, coaching and working for free, providing sports psychology service to the under 18s. And because at that time, what was sports psychology? Mm. And how does it make us better? And how can you improve performance? Well, we've never had one before in football, so why would we have one now? What, <laughs> persuade us that, and we, but we're not gonna pay you for that, by the way, you've got to do that for free. So that was a wonderful journey. And um, I remember uh, after about a year and a half, wonderful experiences with some senior pros naturally evolves work with academy players but then eventually it became um very valuable to the senior pros and because of the i guess early success mm. the opportunity to come up to to come to the midlands um but here's where it gets interesting because this is where i say that there was something else someone else moving the pieces around 
because at the time I was living, I was working part-time at AFC Bournemouth, living in a one-bedroom apartment, working as a lifeguard, teaching, trying to make ends meet. My long-term girlfriend, who's now my wife, became pregnant at the time, Hannah, and uh, I didn't have enough money to, to, to live down in a one-bedroom apartment, let alone mm. secure the future of a, mm. you know, a, a child. So that's when, that's when I think my faith really, I got in touch with my faith in a way that I never had done before and completely surrendered. Mm. Um, I remember praying, um, um, visiting, church speaking to god really asking some pretty deep questions about what he wants me to do with my life and um that's why i say that that journey at that point led me to surrender completely what was the background to that how did you know these things where, where did the idea itself of god come from faith do you have any background in that yeah um I, so really interesting Mum and dad both believe in God in, mm. in completely different ways. Mm. Um, and mum was uh, and is a practicing Catholic, so mm. she goes to church every Sunday without fail. Mm. Told me that I needed to go to church every Sunday without fail. <laughs> and dad would say, you know, we, they, would have, they would often bicker. Mm. You know, he would say, I don't need to go to church every Sunday. I can speak to God right now in my living room if I want to. Mm. So I grew up with that yes. very diverse Yes. Um, experience yeah. of the, of the presence of God. Yeah. So why that tipping point then? Do you think at just then? How old are you? Twenty two. Twenty three. Yeah. Twenty two. Yeah. 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 Why the tipping point? What was the capture it for us? What you really went through, and you say you came to faith. Then, what does that mean? What does that mean for our listener? Yeah. So I had just finished a four year long bachelor of science, mm. graduated with a two one, mm. not the best grade, but you know, mm -hmm. ex valuable experience. Quickly realized that that degree was never going to be enough to do what I wanted to do, mm -hmm. thus doing my badges. Mm -hmm. Even then, wasn't experiencing really a breakthrough in the industry. Yes. I was so determined that I'd moved down from Cambridge to Bournemouth, yeah. spent five years of my life there, and I wasn't about to, I wasn't prepared to go into something that wasn't what I had spent so long studying. The reason I say came to faith then surrendered because I realized at that point my journey had been driven by I think an ego that I was in control of everything I could make things happen in my own life um, I was the one moving the pieces around if it was up if it was meant to be then it was down to me yeah you know, all this sort of stuff mm. fight my way through despite setbacks rely on my own levels of resilience etc etc but there was an emptiness, Della. There was an emptiness that um, I think caused me to realize that um, at that point in my life, I knew of God, but I didn't know God. I knew of my mum's connections, mm. the Catholic upbringing, certain different types of prayers, but I didn't truly know him. I didn't connect him in a way that is very difficult to describe, if I'm honest. It's existential. It's, it's, it's a personal experience we're talking about here, uh, for sure. Let me push on a year or two from that then how did that consolidate itself so coming to christian faith an existential experience that becomes a personal reality which you talk to people about comfortably these days at the highest level of sport as a very respected professional person one more question on the on the journey to faith how did you who, how do you consolidate that security of faith in those first few years? You came to work here, obviously, at Birmingham City. Yep. Uh, which is where we are today. How did that work? Well, that's what I mean about God moving the pieces around. Mm -hmm. um, uh, 
So backtrack slightly, back in Bournemouth, nowhere near the finances mm -hmm. required to look after a newborn family. Mm -hmm. uh, and started to just ask God for help about what he wanted me to do with my life. And this is what I mean about um, not of my own accord. I started to receive uh, emails, invitations, um, interviews, uh, things that I would normally go after proactively that just started turning up. And I really have to say that that's how it happened. And um, there was an opportunity that came up here that was part time. It wasn't even full time. And, um, but it was on significant more money than I was on in Bournemouth. And so I made the leap to come to the Midlands. No one here, no family, no friends, no. <laughs> but this opportunity to, to work for this great club, um, mm. Birmingham City. Mm. And, uh, and the, re the rest is history from there. But I think um, it was a leap of faith professionally, mm. personally, existentially, uh, and just completely surrendered and trusted in the fact that um, this is this was the right thing to do. I, I had met uh, Christian uh, people here at the mm. club mm. as part of the process of the interview, although that wasn't how I got the interview. Mm. And so there are, I came to acknowledge the, the, the signposts along the way that if this was really where I should be, then, um, you know, can I have some kind of sign? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> as, as part of that process. Yeah. And... So the window we're talking about here, Tom, uh, professionally, I think, you're coming to faith in this middle 20s era-ish, early to middle 20s. Um, Birmingham City, uh, went to West Brom, from Birmingham. Yeah. Then Brentford, then Villa. So we're moving around a bit now. Villa's the big, a real big job. How is it working out when you're in the Midlands in those other clubs? How is that shaping up for you? What were you learning? What were you developing both professionally and spiritually? Yeah, wonderful. So, first of all, fantastic time here. Three and a half years. Um, again, progressed through the academy ranks into the senior realms. And the service, I think, of sports psychology was in its infancy, becoming more popular across sporting context I think in other disciplines probably more advanced in football we we are still a little bit behind in terms of a certain sense of to a degree open-mindedness of an understanding of what the role is and how it can help I think there's massive progress now mm. but I certainly developed um, a lot of skill sets professionally across when I moved from Birmingham to West Brom I think the coaching pedagogy at West Brom was something that I'd never seen before. Uh, Who's that down to? Well, I think there was some wonderful people there. Dan Ashworth was the director of football. Oh, well, uh, enough said. <laughs> <laughs> Dan Ashworth, director of football at the time. <laughs> That'll do. <laughs> no, but seriously, I mean, entirely innovative. Yeah. Uh, and of yeah. course you went to work for Dan. Yeah. Huh. Yeah. 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 And at that time, I didn't know. What I was about to encounter. I was just going to a new club. I knew that they were innovative, but and then I got to know Dan very well. And that's what I mean about being blessed to have so many yeah. great teachers and mentors along the way. Yeah. I think he he gave me so much, but I think probably a global understanding or appreciation for the main parts of running a successful football club. He opened up my lens, if you like. Yeah. I was looking through a coaching lens, I was looking through a sports site lens. But he helped me to think bigger, to rise above and see everything from a global perspective. So the move, your move from West Brom to Villa and adding culture to sports performance. Yeah. He has a significant lens offering application there, right? He, you saw the world differently. You knew it, mm. but Dan was a big encourager in that journey then. Huge. And he believed in it. You know, he's, the, here he is at the top of the football club. Yeah. A leader, outstanding leader, was, is, will continue to be, who continuously improves, which is one of the things I really love about him. But he, he really understood the value of the role and how best to integrate the role across all the departments, not just in the coaching realm or not just with the players. 
So help me big influence, really big, strong, positive influence, helping me to grow up essentially in understanding how the role might benefit. But then of course, very quickly, I moved to, to Brentford to work solely with the seniors. Yes. So that moved to Brentford and they were, so, I mean, look at them now, but it started then. Yeah. I mean, the investment in Brentford when you went there mm. was a very, very, very clear uh, qualitative and quantitative analysis mm. of how to build a football club. Wow. So you were in with those guys right at the beginning of that process. Yeah. Tell us a little bit about what you were learning there professionally and personally. Well, I think what I've learned is that, um, just to name drop a few of the yeah. significant people involved in yeah, the project, good. Matthew Benham. I mean, what he, he was the owner, right? He was the one with the foresight. Give us a couple of lines on that because not a, I'm just thinking, I'm saying Dan Ashworth, uh, who is now at Newcastle United as a sporting director, but really galvanised the whole England setup yeah. uh, just before leaving for Newcastle this year. So, uh, you know, absolutely giant of the last 12, 15 years, uh, Cambridge based. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> nice. At one point, get that in. <laughs> uh, but when you went to Brentford then, so Matthew takes over the club. G give people a feel of what that meant because it was a radical transformation. Radical. Sense. Matthew Benham, owner of um, Brentford Football Club, is uh, outright visionary, outstanding, fearless, creative leader. Um, uh, I think in many ways bucks the trend of everything traditional about English football. And was castigated. Yeah, when he took over at Brentford yeah. and laughed at. Yeah, very much. You can't do it that way. It's never been done that way. Yeah. What do you think you're gonna? What are you gonna be the first? Money ball. Ha, ha, ha. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and but the great thing about him is that he he really is somebody who embodies. Because when when we say innovative, it sounds quite sexy, doesn't it? Yes. It sounds quite fresh and bold. Yeah. And but what often we forget about that whole process of being innovative is. It, in, it involves a lot of failures, a lot of setbacks, a lot of challenges along the way. And he really used to go from setback, from challenges, from failures, from failure to failure, trying something new without losing that passionate enthusiasm of the end goal and also inspiring everyone around him to say, now oh, listen, you know, it will we'll just if we just try this idea a different way or we consider this a different way or maybe think about it in this way and it liberated the organization so the culture at Brentford although I didn't know it at the time was so we couldn't outspend other football clubs so we had to outthink and just that process in itself having to outthink to be creative to find new ways of doing things created a culture of of courage of freedom, of excited innovation from the staff. Um, and of course, we had people like Phil Giles and Rasmus Ankerson as mm. the two sporting directors, mm. first ever to split the role and yeah. take the you know, reins of, of two different ways. We had um, a kicking specialist from Poland. We had a head of football philosophy uh, from Denmark. We had an Italian set piece coach. Uh, we had a Dutch head coach and a Dutch assistant head coach. And performance psychologist. Uh, I remember my first day, we were sat around in the team meeting room and it was like being at a UN <laughs> meeting. <laughs> we needed the translator. Um, but again, you know, Matthew wasn't uh, deterred by that. He, he created a melting pot of, of diverse thinking as a competitive advantage. Ooh, ooh. There's too many avenues to go down here, aren't there? There are just too many avenues to pursue. Let's jump from Matthew and Brentford now then. We've talked about Villa, we've talked about West Brom, we've talked about Birmingham, we've talked about Bournemouth. We haven't got near being in Tokyo and all the work you've done around particularly swimming and other sports for, for GB athletics uh, and track and field and swim teams. Where you are today, now, as we're in this discussion, so much access to innovators, particularly in football, in those early times, that gave you these opportunities to grow. When you wrote, when you authored the book, uh, which will be in the notes uh, for the podcast, I made some notes on the future coach, and because it, it, it's all about coaches and sports psychology. 
it, you're really wanting the coach to get it. So you're speaking as somebody with an eclectic view across all staff and all people, not just players and coaches. But there are nine things you, you think, I'm going to crystallize what I've got thus far in life into nine things for coaches. How did you shape the book? I thought about, I think that when people ask me, you know, when did you write the book? It was released in 2017. Mm. But of course, I think over the last, the 10 years before that, I was always writing the book, mm. really, um, through reflective journal entries and um, different papers that I wrote uh, through the LMA as well. And uh had a collection of these ideas, but reinforced and evolved really with practical experiences as I grew as a practitioner too, as a coach. So I, I think the book was in the writing since 2007, um, but surfaced in 2017 as, as an amalgamation of, um, of concrete experiences that I knew at that time um, really made a difference because I'd been privileged to have been in some incredible frontline dressing rooms under some significant head coaches, managers, directors of football, owners. Mm. So I knew that these things were defining. Yeah, and It I is providential, to... isn't it? I mean, you think of the names, we won't repeat them again, some of the names we've just talked about here. I mean, these are pivotal tipping points in professional soccer as it is today, professional football as it is today, aren't they? Yeah. I mean, Obviously, the result of your work and the book is you'd met Lee Carsley here, presumably, at Birmingham City. Yeah. And obviously, he's central now in the England setup for the development of young players. And you regularly do seminars together. Is it slightly weird for you to see it almost being normative? Gareth Southgate, Lee Carsley, the, the whole team, really, in, in, England, in England, anyway, in England football. Yeah. I mean, this is a generation of people who don't see it as innovative to be doing these things or to think these ways. That must be so exciting to have been part of the journey of these guys. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And um, like you said, there are so many names to mention that we probably couldn't mention them all. No. But I think to come full circle, it reinforced my faith that these things were important. Yeah. And and that a new generation of, of, of coaches had emerged and were emerging and are emerging to shape the very fabric of, 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 of football in our country. Um, it doesn't get much more exciting than that. And Lee and Gareth were, were two who um, I was working with. Uh, Gareth uh, was interviewed for the book and shared some of his experiences. And it's just a real privilege, like I said, to be around these professionals. Lee was the first team captain of here when I first uh, arrived at Birmingham City. Uh, turned coach and um, what did you see in Lee what did you see in Lee somebody that was able to continue to evolve to grow to th improve not to, to be afraid to think differently I think that was the one thing that, that, that stood out he was senior first team captain but even at that time when he was you know 17 years in the Premier League captain every club that he'd been at arrives at Birmingham first team captain but what he did as a captain is brought the young players with him, spent time speaking with them, working with them. If he was involved in a practice, he'd actively be coaching them through whilst in the practice and playing and performing himself, you know? So ultimate senior leader within the team, but cared. Uh, it brings me right back to the first chapter, which is the relationship coach. Yes. The relationship coach on this idea that people don't care how much you know until you know how much... You care. Okay. Yeah. But in your time, you know, you say 2007 to 2017 in that decade, the book's written. But ridiculous, really. I mean, this is a formative stage for you, but it's it's synonym, or it's, it, it's coherent because it, it's at exactly the same time as significant changes in English football. Uh, e Triple P comes a little bit after that, but the whole vision of the elite player performance plan was both technical and tactical, and about personal, yeah. about holistic people. Slip over to your uh, other hats then with uh, GB at Tokyo. And, and for those, I'm sure people would be interested in this, you know, the sort of historically macho male football world of, of the noughties that we've seen transition in. When you move from that to working with individual athletes, 
track and field athletes, swimmers. That's a shift, right? Where, where was that world at in relation to your football world when you first stepped into it? Well, without being disrespectful to the industry of football, mm. um, when I started to work in other sports professionally, I realized how far football actually was still behind. And Olympic sports in particular, it was like stepping into an oxygen chamber because I, I didn't have to convince or persuade anyone that performance psychology, you know, mental skills training was important for elite performance. It was the reverse. They wanted as much as possible to search for the 1% that would define performance for them when it mattered in the arena. And so, again, richly blessed to walk into an environment that was led by some senior directors who created that culture, who accelerated that culture. And um, my integration into Olympic sport was really because of the culture and leadership that those senior directors. What did. was the first step of that? How did, literally, how did that happen? Because you'd worked in football for a long time. Yeah. Big decision, actually, to take work outside of football, I mean, mm. contracts and jobs and roles in big professional clubs. What was the action that precipitated that move? What did you do? Well, some reflection. After I got sacked at Aston Villa, mm. um, we lost to Fulham uh, at Wembley in the championship uh, playoff. Mm. And uh, some significant reflection took place over whether or not I wanted to be involved in professional football full time. I'd done it for 15, 16 years of my life up to that point. And I just felt again that there was a, that I needed to go and experience different performance contexts to understand my role. I needed to grow actually, to go beyond the performance psychologist working in football, mm. to go and experience different environments, to go and see if what I knew could be applied in different mm. environments. Mm. So the first step was to reflect on that. And of course, when you leave a job or a position, you're afforded that mm -hmm. time to go and do that. So then uh, through different series of combination conversations, really working with other practitioners, um, I've had a mentor work with me for many, many years by the name of Bill Beswick. He's mm -hmm. been so influential for me professionally. And so we did um, progressive thinking together to sit down and think about what the next step would look like and formulated this idea of, you know, going independent, becoming an independent mm. consultant. Mm. And, um, and there's always that fear, I think, that was very real, very present. What if I don't get any clients? What if there are no players that want to work with me mm. anymore? Mm. What if there aren't any organizations that believe in this? What? So again, another pivotal point professionally, but also in my faith journey, um, to take the step outside of something that I've been doing full time for seven, 16, 17 yeah. years. And interesting listening at this point, as we were wandering around big ticket items and personal life, there are two periods, this may be a bit too superficial, but there are two periods that you've narrated for us anyway which is that leave, not going to make it as a player uh, and the, the significant existential experience you had then and a faith experience. And then now you're, you're getting headhunted by people all the time. Once you've gone to Birmingham, you know, people want you for jobs. They want you. You've climbed and climbed and climbed. You've got probably the, the biggest title in English football in terms of the opportunity to influence with a culture added on to the typical uh, name that will go with your job. Getting the sack, you say it, that's a blow, right? Because you're not used to being sacked at all at this yeah. point, are you? Yeah. What about your, you mentioned your faith was an important factor in this period. You've articulated some of us. Have you found you draw more and got an adversity? Is that normative or not necessarily? So it's not meant to be a leading question. It's not meant to be. Yeah. Not necessarily, mm -hmm. not necessarily for me personally. There have been times of, I mean, I remember being in Tokyo, Japan, when Adam Peaty became the first man to defend his 100 meter breaststroke gold medal from Rio to Tokyo. So not just four years, but five. A significant moment of, mm -hmm. of genuine admiration, respect, love for someone who 
I have a very close relationship, working relationship with. And, you know, so I remember also um, being so thankful, thankful to God for those experiences at the peak of my, what you could call in inverted commas, success mm. as a practitioner. Mm. So not always in adversity, but I do think particularly those two experiences we've talked about, inevitably um, adversity has stirred a, um, a certain element of searching and reflection and asking deeper questions than beyond the day-to-day -day surface. Mm. And, I, and I think rather than being the questioner but a commentator at this point, uh, my experience of mostly professional football, being much older than you, but across a range of sports, Olympic sports and so on, has been that one aspect of the Christian faith that I've observed in people's lives over a number of years will be a, almost a threefold consequence of being an elite athlete and indeed coach for that matter, is that a Christian faith gives you an assurance almost that when it's going really well, you're always remembering, well, these gifts that I have to do this, they are gifts. I was given them by my creator and I, I'm able to use them and I'll take agency in them. But there are good highs, aren't there? And there's a humility in the high, not always, but sometimes you'll find a humility as a high in the Christian, as a Christian. In the lows, you'll find a depth of learning and realization that actually God loves you, whether you're successful or not, when it's all stripped away. And of course, that's the bit we don't fancy. But both, that's why I asked it in the way I did it, both are significant. You know, the highs and the lows, in different ways, they draw you back to who's the source of your being here in your life. And then, and then finally, and I, I, look, I hear this in you here now as we're talking. Those two things give the capacity to give away, to love, mm. to, to, to not be so consumed with one's own success or failure at any one moment that there's something left in the tank, as it were, or change the metaphor, in the ram, to give, to give to the other, to get your eyes off yourself. Would that be a fair reflection of your ups and downs? And how have you used that capacity to have equilibrium, to love others mm. in your professional life? Mm. It's, oh, Dan, I think um, I'm still on that journey, is the first thing to say. So I don't believe for any second that I've got it cracked right now. Mm. Uh, but what I think changed um, is that striving, ambitiously striving, occupationally, to get to the top, in inverted commas, um, is, was very much driven for me by the sense of the ego, particularly when things like um, television documentaries came out, mm. Sky Sports, BBC, mm. Netflix, across different production companies, there's a temptation for the ego to get involved and say, you're the man, mm. well done. Mm. Uh, and then I've got this sense of, for me, my background in a, in work, a working class family. So none of my parents or family members went to university. And so there's that personal journey as well that you reflect on and say, the temptation is to say, yeah, I did this. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so my ego was large. Mm. Um, and then there's this wonderful thing by Dr. Wayne Dyer. I've got to bring it up because it, it's something, it's my go-to. So when I want to see, this is one of my islands. Um, the ego, ed edging God out, E-G-O, edging God out. And there are five constructs and I can recognize myself in this so much over the years and even to a degree now. Number one is I am what I have. So let's think about this in the context of industry. So here's an industry with stratospheric finances involved that inevitably at some level can lead to the corruption of character, let's just say. Number one, I am what I have. The money, the cars, mm. the fame, the status. That's my identity. Number two, I am what I do. I am the head of. I am the superstar striker. I am the gaffer. 
I am they. I'm a, I am what I have, I am what I do. Here's a big one. Number three, I am what other people think of me. The press, the media, the fans, the sponsors, the manager, whoever. Number four, I am separate from others. Five, I'm separate from God. And I think, to go back to your question, during the times of adversity, I've recognised, I've been able to recognise how large my own ego was during the successful times. And therefore, a depth of reflection that went beyond this surface identity of those things, which ultimately results in, I'm a child of God, and Jesus Christ is my Lord and Saviour, and everything that I have here on this earth is a true blessing. It's a gift, as you just said. Mm. When I recognise those gifts, that's when I'm less concerned with what success is. I'm less concerned with whether or not the managing director of the organisation is going to think I'm good at my job, if I give a presentation, I'm less concerned with what the so-called key decision makers think and I'm more focused on whether on what I'm saying is true or not and how can it help others. So everything becomes about service, removing myself from and being a, a really a, a servant leader, if you like, has transformed everything. And that couldn't take place. That could not take place without surrendering. Tom Bates. <laughs> Absolutely class. Thank you very much indeed.